All righty. What's going on, guys? Uh, welcome back to Surviving Hollywood. I'm Johnny Ray Diaz. I am Aaron Arnold. I am Austin Arnold. Lion King. Jungle Book. You guys heard of these movies? Maybe you have. I don't know. Life, Lifetime's Au Pair. Not Au Pair Nightmare. Au Pair Nightmare. Hey, you know, whatever. The Judge. The Judge. Popular movies. You guys might have heard of them. Uh, we just talked to a uh, really good friend of mine that I've known in Arizona. We used to work together on a TV show called Right This Minute. We were both camera operators. Uh, we both moved to LA, not at the same time, different times, different paths. But uh, he's uh, this buddy of mine has been really successful. We've worked on Jungle Book again, Lion King, Ender's Game, as uh, an assistant editor, post production assistant, Ian McLaren. And uh, you know what, man? He's just a good dude. Like, he's actually one of uh, my good friends that we've kind of stayed in touch since day one, pretty much. It's a really good podcast conversation. You're probably looking at this now going, oh, this is uh, over an hour. This is a little bit, little bit longer than what they usually record. And it's just because the conversation was worth it. You know, we were happy just to chill and, and talk with this guy. And he was telling us stories about working with Favreau and Robert Downey Jr. And we were overall just discussing what kind of movies we like and stuff like that. I love this take on generally Scorsese and um, Tarantino, but also the next prop, like, like who he likes coming up in Hollywood. And also, Johnny, you asked him like advice to younger editors. And I thought he had great perspective. Yeah, I think mean, he had some really good insight. And then I think there was at one point you kind of talked to him about like what – you know, what actors can do to help the editor. Sure. I, I thought that was a really valuable question. That actually almost like, he had to stop and think about that for a second. <laughs> um, but uh, he had some uh, some good responses to that. And overall, you know, the dude, he's the film guy. That's why I think we've been friends for so long. We just, we love to go watch movies together. And um, just an overall class act and, uh, you know, unemployed. So uh, looking for a job now by choice. By choice. By choice. Or not COVID. his choice. Not or his COVID. choice. That's he true. says, I only work Just for kidding. Disney. Companies at Disney's level are higher or nothing at all. Yeah. And if you guys listen to the podcast, you'll find out why he has absolutely refused to ever edit one of our movies. Absolutely refused. <laughs> Get ready for that. Enjoy. Welcome to the Surviving Hollywood Podcast. Oh, no, I'm sick and tired of Harry. I'm sick and tired of having to eke my way through life. Starring Johnny Ray Diaz. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. You can't handle the truth! Aaron Arnold. Dark is your life. Really adopted the dark. I was born in it. Austin Arnold. Goddamn people! Line. Um... Do you guys, sorry, I don't know if we're like, I know we're recording and I don't know how this works. Do you guys look, like, how do you want me to, am I looking in the camera or am I looking at you four as I, or is it kind of whatever? Whatever you feel, dude. You're just, as long as you're looking in the direction of your screen, I think it's going to be, okay. it's gonna <laughs> seem like you're looking at any of us. And does the, do the glasses like affect you guys at all? Like in terms of reflections? The, the shirt, the shirt bothers me a little the bit. The glasses but, well. make me feel inferior, but other than that. All right, cool. <laughs> Going for that look, man. <laughs> um all right so yeah so this is it right we just chat and yeah we just talk dude it's, it's okay. more just we're just gonna kind of bullshit with you i mean i already know you i've known you for a long time but yeah uh we just uh just wanted to hang out man maybe, all right maybe for the folks at home we can just say ian's job in general um role in cinema in la ex editor extraordinaire right bingo dude it's like you were looking at my card man What's your specialty with editing? Because I know editors like have like, isn't it like, uh, I don't know, like they each have special things like, I don't even know. You mean just in terms of like stuff we like to do or stuff we think we're better at? Or... I don't know. I'd assume for Disney, they'd have like uh, these kind of editors over here doing the fur and these kind of editors doing uh, the landscape. Or... I gotcha. Well, those kind of comments just show how little you know. About <laughs> 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 um, yeah, man. I mean... I've uh, I've been editing uh, since film school, so like 13 years now, I guess. Jesus, time flies. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I haven't really been editing professionally until like honestly my last gig, which was the feature film I did for Lifetime. But um, 
just doing a lot of assistant editing work is what I've been doing for Disney. So I've been assistant editing with the fur. That's what I've been doing, you know. And what, what assistant <laughs> editor is are they, you putting together? Like yeah, I mean, so I can break it down because I know Johnny said this is kind of for like filmmakers and actors and stuff. So there's some kind of a shorthand, I'm assuming, with, with people. But um, basically, like... Anybody would love to work for Disney. So yeah, tell us what the job is at Disney if you're an assistant yeah, editor. Yeah, so I'm, I'm freelance. So I basically work from show to show for different companies. Um, <laughs> so my last one... The, the last big one I did was The Lion King. So I was technically working for Disney, but like I don't, once the movie starts and ends, I don't work for them anymore. I basically, I'm just trying to find another gig, kind of like you guys do as actors. Um, so like with Disney, I was an assist, I was an apprentice editor is my credit on, on The Lion King. So I'm, essentially I was an assistant editor. Um, and that's just kind of making sure the editor has everything he needs, making sure the project that we're all working from is organized and up to date. You know, I think on, you know, usually a show like a smaller film, some of the smaller films I worked on, like the judge or um, wonder that was primarily like the editor, the first assistant editor. So kind of his right hand man. And then there was an, a second assistant editor and that, and then I would be the, the post-production assistant. And that was basically our team. It was like a four man team for jungle book and Lion King, which were obviously a lot bigger, VFX and all this stuff. Um, for Lion King, our team was uh, two editors because there was just the way that movie was made, there was just too much workflow for one editor to handle it all. Um, so there's two editors, and then there were there's the first assistant editor, and then there were two assistant editors plus me, so technically three assistant editors, and then two visual effects editors. So that is what, like 10 people? I'm so bad at math, something like that. And then you have like the post-production supervisor and coordinator who are in charge of like keeping the train on the tracks. They're the kind of in between with the studio and John and the producers and kind of, you know, go back and forth to make sure that everyone's happy on, on all sides. Um, so it just kind of varies show to show. I've heard some shows literally only have an editor and an assistant and that's it. Like apparently that's how they make a lot of the Blumhouse movies. Um, it just kind of depends because, you know, with editing, there's a lot of editorial wise, there's a lot of uh, overflow in terms of equipment and office space. Well, that's different now, but office space and all these things. So they usually try to like pare down on that stuff, especially when they ramp up, because usually inevitably, as you guys know, like as just the further you get into a show, all of a sudden there's way more stuff that needs to happen and like less time and more stuff, you know, more there's people, more, more people. On that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it kind of, inevitably even though we all know how it's going to end they still pretend like it's not going to go that way like my wife amanda she's a um post-production supervisor and she's working on a show right now and like she's having these same situations where she's like talking to these you know the producers and the execs about situations and like all right well this is how much the budget is but like i can tell you right now this budget is going to change and we should maybe start talking about that now and it's amazing how they movies been made this way forever and they still like are surprised when like things change or the money goes up or you know what i mean what so, show is she working on by the way uh you, well okay you say not can't say well it. she i can say <laughs> she's working on wandavision right now oh, okay that's the right Marvel show. the model show is What's that gonna called? be on apple or it's, it no it's on disney plus wandavision wandavision yeah it's uh it's wanda sykes <laughs> I, I'd I watch that show yeah because then i would have an in with larry potentially that way <laughs> there you go um no it's like uh i guess i don't know how much is known about it it's it's just like the characters Wanda uh scar or what's her name wanda romanoff and uh vision paul bettany and uh yeah paul bettany oh, oh, paul bettany. yeah nice. so is paul, is paul bettany gonna be in it yeah yeah, yeah i think okay. so yeah nice it's, it's it seems like a cool show from what i understand i mean again i can't Okay. I'm not at liberty to say much about it because I'm not supposed to know a lot about it. But just based on the way things have been going right now, she's working from our dining room. So I unfortunately, like I, I hear a lot and see a lot that I shouldn't be, but I can't talk about it. So question, so you, question for you, Ian. I've heard um, our animation editors for feature films paid well because I remember when Seth Rogen did the sausage movie, there was that those reports saying all the editors didn't get paid or something. That I can't speak to. I don't know what was going on there. I mean, I've never really worked on an animation movie before. Um, but The Lion King. 
I mean, the, how dare you, sir? That was a real <laughs> live action shoot. All right, man. Did you not read the press release? Um, no, nah, no, nah, I hear you. That actually, that was the closest thing. Um, and you must know what goes on in the industry in general for that kind of stuff. Well, it depends. Like animation studios are completely different because that's like a whole, you know, they're, they're their own entity and they basically just have a big room full of cubicles and different animators work and they just have deadlines and like, sections and however they do it i don't know how they piecemeal together so, so like, you don't consider what you do animation editing because it's cgi is that the difference i mean the thing like so like the lion king was made very traditionally in an animated film um way in that there were storyboards for our movie and yeah, all the, the original all the, the original 1994 movie was the story well you would right? think so but <laughs> we actually redid all the storyboards um, we met, we actually made jokes about that all the time. Was dude. was your storyboard just the movie then? Is that what it was? <laughs> I mean, dude, that's to be honest, that's like that's movie, how you're like that. That's that was success. Let's go with that. Genius, <laughs> Favro, you got it. <laughs> that's how a lot of us felt, to be honest, because there were moments where we were asked to like redo something, and we're just like, why don't we just pop in the 1994 version? <laughs> it's all done for us. We don't have to do anything. Um, but you know, because our movie like has so many uh, voice actors who are doing you know the animals. Um, so you, we, we basically attacked it like an animated film. So these, you know, these cast members came in and recorded their dialogue like two years or whatever before we had a movie and then storyboards were used and then that kind of creates stuff. And then as they, and despite what everyone may believe, we did actually shoot that movie. It's just the way it was, which is why we can call it live action. It was just the way the, we shot it on a stage. It was just a virtual stage. So um i think a lot of this is out there so i don't think i'm andy circus played all the parts or yeah andy circus was not allowed on set man after he remade he decided to do his own version of uh the jungle book john's like oh hell no man andy circus didn't come anywhere on my set um, so, how does, so how does it work because I'm, I'm curious like you saying that they shot it on a virtual stage so yeah do they have like an actor is sort of in placeholder for where the animal is or what so, is how does so it like work? basically how it works is um <laughs> They did so like when we did Jungle Book, there that you know, there was the live action element of the child and, and any anything that Mowgli came in contact with on the movie. So any set or any prop he picked up, that was a real thing. So like you know, two third or like I guess a third of that movie is like live action. I mean most of that movie is live action because he's basically in every scene and then we just animated around it. Lion King in in order to animate, you kind of you have the set uh you know we had a real set on that one but like we also had it scanned and digitized so you could still you know when the animators were doing all the you know bagheera and blue and all the stuff around them they had they had a 3d space to work within that matched the the live action set so when we did lion king a lot of that kind of idea came across like came to that project as well but because there was no live action child um the way we did it was literally john and his team you know his production designer and you know whoever else they would design the set in the computer so like pride rock for example so they would create this pride rock very rough looking like we always joked like we'd say the graphics were like playstation 2 3 playstation 2 3 kind of s graphics um, so very crude, obviously, compared to what it turned into. But like the physical rock that they made. Sort the, of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but modern. literally, the way it was done is John would direct, you know, like, let's say it's Mufasa and Simba going up to the top of, of Pride Rock is the scene. So obviously, it's all animated. So John and his team, and again, I, I always forget, like, who was there? There's a million, you know, there's like 200 people on this movie. So it's always hard to remember. But um John and his team would basically decide how they want, you know, the characters to interact in the scene and kind of stage the scene in that, you know, they go from point A to point B this way. We're going to use, you know, it's going to be a wide shot and the medium shot, blah, 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 blah. The animators would create this very rough animation of that happening. So in terms of us shooting the movie though, is we legitimately had shoot days and we had call times and we'd show up on the set, which was this big giant, stage but it was just all that we called the black box this is all one big black room basically and they had this camera rigged to a dolly that was connected to the computer and essentially the dp um could uh, uh what's his name deschanel zoe's father i'm so bad oh, he's like a really famous 
Caleb, Caleb Deschanel. Uh, he's a famous cinematographer. Um, him and John would go over everything and they would do a take. And so like, literally it would be that camera angle of what John described before of Pride Rock, point A to B, Mufasa and Simba walking. But then- And you, as an, decide, editor, you as an editor are like in the space this, seeing him do it or? Yeah, so we had a we had an avid uh, setup on stage. That's why we had two editors, to be honest. We had, uh, Mark was kind of the, um, he worked primarily with John and did a lot of the story or the like character emotional beats. And Adam also was our second editor who was, he was doing like live editing on the stage. And it helped, that helped John a lot because he could see a really cut, rough cut of a scene while they were shooting it. And then he, he would basically be like, oh yeah, this is working great. Or he may want to change it. Um, but in terms of like how we shot it is if John or Caleb, the DP or somebody wasn't happy with how it looked, John and the team would put on these VR goggles that would basically, they would be seeing like they were standing on the set of Pride Rock and they could walk around the set and basically be like, well, the camera right now is set up this way, but they could literally pick up a digital camera and then move it somewhere else on the set and plant it. And then they could change everything about it. And that's how it would work. And then you could just, then the animators could change the, the way the animals would walk or move or whatever. So it's like, it was, it was shot like a live action movie. Like we shot, I don't know off the top of my head, but we shot like a hundred days or whatever. Like we had like a hundred days of shooting that whole film. Um, and, and then that, a lot of stuff gets tweaked and changed when it's like further in animation, you know, development. And if John or whoever wants to change stuff, they, you know, they can, I want to say. Did they have to, uh, did they have to make a crude mock-up of every single scene? Yeah. So we had sets, like we had digital sets for everything, you know, the hyena caves and the gorge and, you know, uh, Timon and Pumbaa's area and all that stuff. Um, but like, it was true. It was shot like a movie. It just was entirely digital. So it wasn't like, you know, this is the shot, you know, like an animated movie was where they just draw, you know, pencil it out and they can change it or whatever. Like John would literally on the fly, just be like, let's punch in here or whatever. And then they could virtually do that. And so like the, the camera that was hooked up to the dolly, they could do really cinematic zooms or pushes or whatever. And they would literally have to be pushing or pulling the, the dolly, even though it wouldn't be shooting on anything. It's just the way it was set up with the camera and the computer world. It just, that's just how it worked. Is it so it's very interesting. Is it safe to say that like the editor too is almost the director? Yeah, I mean, I got to be careful what I say, with, <laughs> depending on who listens to this. Well, I, I mean, mean, just based on what you're saying, there's, it feels like there's such an integral part in the directing process. Mm-hmm. Probably right? nobody you like, know is going to listen to this. Well, I, <laughs> I hope so. How do you know, man? John could be John's favorite podcast. You never yeah, know. Yeah, hey. true. Probably. Um, He's the next guest, actually. I was going to say, I could tell him. I'll, I'll hit him up after this, let him know, uh, <laughs> listen to me on the podcast. Um, yeah, I mean, the editor is instrumental in that. Um, you know, it was, it was the editor and, uh, and the whole editorial's job to make sure what we were doing was working, you know, so, you know, as, as any movie basically, but in terms of like, it's a little different on like a regular production where, you know, an editor and his team are brought in as they're, they go into production and then they're there to kind of do the dailies and do rough cuts and, and stuff like that. And then, you know, later on the line, when they decide they need to redo stuff, they do reshoots or whatever, ours, we could actually basically like reshoot on the fly as we were going along with it. Um, but I mean, it was crazy. Like in, in Mark's office upstairs, you know, if he would be in, a, in an editing session with John and showing John different, you know, what he was doing, there was still a feed. There was a video feed like in the office. So John could always see what they were shooting on set. And then if he had to go down there, he would go down there um, and stuff like that. But I mean, it, it's, it's, it's always like, you know, it's a, symbiotic relationship you know like a collaboration obviously filmmaking is all about collaborations but um in terms of john and mark who you know they did jungle book and they did this together john was very um trusting of of mark and and adam later on to just he you know he knew the proof was in the pudding you know in terms of they were putting together what john wanted or felt like was right so 
John was very good about letting them kind of do their own thing. And you know? what do you think makes John such a great director? Because he is a great director. He's d- he directed is. so many great classics, Elf, all those Disney, Marvel movies, so many good stuff. Made, dude. I love Made. That's my favorite John Favreau dude, that's, movie. That's a good one. Swingers, uh, he wrote. I love that movie. Yeah, Swingers, he wrote. Um, I will say John is um, he's very smart and uh, he's really good about I mean, a really good director and obviously they have talent and they do their own thing. But one thing that makes them, sets them, I think, apart from the not as, I don't want to say as great directors, but not as accomplished directors maybe, um, is he surrounds himself with very talented, creative people and people he knows who will do the work and that he can trust. Um, But John is very aware of the thing, I think, that in terms of being around him and, and meetings and hearing the way he talks about stuff um he's very aware of the audience and he's very aware of like playing to their strengths um but he's also like he's aware that you know they're smart and like sometimes you're not going to get away with stuff and and you know he's aware of like you know the emotional manipulation and scenes and those kind of things so he gives the credit i think more than to the people who are going to watch the movie more than a lot of other filmmakers do um you know especially like the studio side of things you hear so many horror stories about studios recutting films or changing films because they didn't think the audience was gonna really understand or feel the same way about it um but john's very good about that i think he's he's a good storyteller it's i think that's i mean you see it when he does stuff like mandalorian and stuff like he just he knows how to really tap into the The mandalorian was so good yeah man he did a good job on that yeah, okay, yeah, and yeah. that's the same thing. Very collaborative. You know, you had him and Dave Filoni and you had all these other directors. Did you uh, talk to John about Eric the Clown? I did not. I Ooh. wish I would have, dude. That would have been great. Should it have just mentioned it one day, dude. Well, dude, it's funny, I'm man. Like, <laughs> Who is that? John, John is a really Sein- nice guy. Seinfeld. He, so he was in Seinfeld, John Favreau. <laughs> he played uh, Eric the Clown in Seinfeld. Oh, whoa. It's like, it like a guest spot in that episode. Too. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, that was like one of his earliest acting roles because that was in like 1992. I mean, I know yeah. he had done like Rudy and stuff, but no, yeah, but nobody really knew. Who but it was nobody, yeah, time. nobody remembers that except hardcore Seinfeld fans, like many of us are. But like, how many times did somebody go up to him and be like, "That's money, John. That's money." No, yeah, you know, everyone does that, and they get fired immediately if you do. That. <laughs> <laughs> really? No, not really. I'm just kidding. I All mean, right. like John, John is a. He's I a think really that's nice a cool. Guy. That's a cool thing to say say to somebody. Money. You know? Well, I'm sure he's heard it all every day his oh, entire man, life. He's, uh, he's jaded, but uh, he he is a really like he's a really nice guy. But he is very like reserved and like you know it, he like I don't mean this to sound he just he doesn't really interact with you unless he has to. Oh but man, that's I, you it's know, two hundred people on set. You know, he can't. Yeah, well, that and like you know he's an actor. Like he you know and he's kind of arguably he's very recognizable and public and famous and so mm-hmm. like. I think because of that, you just have this kind of wall reserve, sure. you know, this kind of reservation. Um, but I mean, I, I could probably count on like one hand the amount of times I've talked to him. And even though I've worked with him on two films, like, and if you add the time up, like over four years, like he doesn't know. My and what did he say to you? What was, what was, what did he say to you? I don't, I mean, I don't remember. Like it was usually just stuff about like, he, he makes a lot of jokes on set. Like I, I know you guys wanted like a good, funny ass story to tell <laughs> i mean i well, will say he cooks he would don't want to get lot. you in trouble dude no i know well, that's there's the nothing thing. to get in like, trouble he said john favreau is great we've all seen his films and he is great yeah there we go that's it that's it and i'm sticking to it actually <laughs> well, i have a lot i have a lot of friends who are working with with him on mandalorian 2 right now so i'm like okay. well he was uh because he did that movie chefs and he, he learned how to cook for that movie right yeah yeah so like um he that was really cool i mean like on jungle book he would cook like food all the time on set for the crew like he made the he made like grilled cheeses and all this like i think he did what grilled cheese and chef maybe or something he, he was like so into cooking from that movie he like i mean again i don't know if this is like public knowledge he like remod he like remodeled his whole kitchen to like have like a professional chef kitchen in his house and stuff like he's really into cooking like he would do <laughs> he'd do all kinds of great stuff like you go into the office and he'd be like making his own beef jerky like in the conference room and like <laughs> He would have like brisket and turkey flown in from Franklin's barbecue in Austin. And like, he just would do crazy stuff and you'd be, you know, like he would always have people like coming to the office, checking stuff out. And like, 
So you'd have like Roy Choi, who's the the guy who taught him how to cook. He's the guy who does like Kogi. He has, owns Kogi in LA and a bunch of other restaurants in LA. But um, he would always have like people walk by. You're like, oh shit, there's Faison Love or oh like who are like <laughs> people he knows and he loves. You know, like when we were shooting Jungle Book, like they were shooting season two of True Detective on the same lot that we were on, and so like him and Vince would always be hanging out like in between stuff and Mark. they're friends again right yeah, i think they're always friends no they weren't uh, for a while but were they not that was a long time ago but anyway uh, they should be friends because <laughs> they they were they're so good together i mean that sounds that sounds like a fun matchup to see is favreau and vince just hanging out that seems yeah. like a good time yeah i mean phase on love yeah, yeah. phase on love was good he was a good guy to me i was a pa when i i met him and he uh he asked for a coffee at Starbucks because I was going there because I had to do my daily runs. Threw it in your face. He want, he wanted like a little – I forgot what he got. It was like something little or whatever. But like I got back like 20 minutes later, and he like waited for me to like bring it. But he was like totally cool about it. But he like felt bad about ordering food or coffee and then leaving early. That's the kind of stuff as a PA you like – because usually you have people like sip their coffee and throw it in your face when it's not good, you know. So to have someone like actually waiting 20 minutes to get it was pretty good. Dude, they pulled a kingpin. I know, dude. <laughs> These guys don't know. I've seen that scene. Yeah, we I've know. Seen that dude. scene. Dude. How, how do you not that? know? Exactly, dude. How do you not know, man? Pin. Johnny, you've showed like, it to us like a hundred times. It's like, well, it's like one of the Ian. funniest scenes in movie yeah. history, dude. Oh, dude and, I always laugh about that scene with Ian, man. That scene's so funny, dude. Crazy bastard. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get in here, you crazy bastard? You guys have never seen that movie? You guys really I've seen it. I've seen it. I've oh, seen okay. like it on like... Not all the way through at any one time. Dude, but. Bill, Bill Murray is so good in that. Yeah, he's like, on, like best, TV. Ernie TV. McCracken. Yeah. It's the best role, I think. It's Anybody feel one. free to search um, Kingpin hot coffee scene and you'll find it. Hey, I think if your listeners are smart, they, they already know. It's I'm just trying to, cl- I want to clue everybody in, you know, bring all everybody right, in. Fair enough. Fair enough. Just watch the movie, guys. I think everyone should just watch the movie. So you also uh, edited a Lifetime movie. These guys actually just did a Lifetime movie. Oh, nice. Long ago. Uh, you might have edited ours. ours. No, I did not. I don't think I would. <laughs> I would remember your faces if I edited yours. Um, because you're so handsome, of course. Hey. Oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> hey. Um, yeah, man. So um, so no um, animation I, in the Lifetime movie. I, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be nice, actually. I think that'd be, I think you're onto something there. You actually, I've been hearing because of COVID, animation is going to, like, the next couple of years, we're going to see so much animation because that's the only thing people can really make right now without shooting. I, I've heard for all the regular movies, uh-huh. for any time somebody, like, touches another person, you're going to have to, like, if I have to touch a girl in a scene on her shoulder, both of us have to be cleared five days, quarantined for five days before that. Or if it's some, like, heavy touching or something, like a sex scene, It'll just be like CGI. That's just I heard somebody saying it. Who knows if it's true or would be done? But it's gonna be crazy, man. It's I mean, especially for you guys. Like we're you know we're kind of isolated in our offices. You know, like I think on every movie I've ever worked on, I think I've worked on like six features, like film. You know, proper studio features. Now I think I've only been on set like for two of those movies. Um, I guess three technically with Lion King, but. Like that being said, it's like, you know, we're not really on set. We're usually just in our offices, like away from the sunlight, you know, just like not talking to anybody. But like you guys, you know, being actors, like I don't know what production life is going to look like. It's so crazy, man. Just because, as you know, it's like how many people are just on set standing around doing nothing and everyone's touching stuff like crafty. What the hell is going to happen with crafty? Like everybody is super close trying to get out of the shot. It's the reason why I became an actor, man. Was a crafty. I know, dude. I hear you, bro. In the sex scenes. But, but yeah, <laughs> dude, you're out of luck there too, man. Both know, of them. Man. What am I gonna do? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, man, it's it's uh so life the lifetime movie I did was um, my buddy Joe Russo, who I went to film school with. Not, I mean, he's a great Joe Russo, but he's not the more famous i was gonna ask yeah. i feel like i know that name but it's not that Dude, he i hope he doesn't mind me telling the story and if he does you know oh well he was at like he told me a few years ago this, i think this was like maybe bef- even before they made the the captain america movie so they were still like really big maybe they had just done the the winter soldier but they were still really known for like their tv you know like arrested development and modern family and you know parks and rec and all these shows <laughs> but um Joe was at like some, my buddy Joe was at some mixer, like some networking mixer or whatever. 
and like somebody found out like oh joe russo's here and they like went up to him and were like hey man are you joe russo and he's like yeah i'm joe and they like shook their hands he's like oh i'm so and so and he's like what was it like working on arrested development like, <laughs> uh that, that that wasn't me and the dude just like walked <laughs> he was like oh, oh. he just walked away <laughs> it was like that's, Shit. that's hollywood baby that that's is hollywood, hollywood dude <laughs> um yeah he uh he went to film school with me he's he was a little he was a year ahead of uh, me but I've been editing a short film since like 12 years now, I think. I've done like five, four or five of his short films over the years. And this opportunity for him to write and direct a feature film came up. He was producing this movie called Nightmare Cinema. Um, and one of the line producers on that, they do a lot of Lifetime movies. And so they knew he was a writer and, and him and his partner, Chris, were writers. And Did he write the movie too? He wrote it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he wrote it. Um, off pair nightmares out is called yeah it was originally just called the off pair but we knew it was going to be changed or something because that's what those lifetime movies well do. they changed they changed your guys too what, what was the original title originally splitting image, splitting image and then yeah. they because it was twins and then they changed it to married to a murderer yeah. <laughs> that's what they do it's they, nuts like there we we kept thinking they were going to call ours like psycho nanny or something like that you know like it's just when you when you go on because you know we don't have tv so it's like we just like have the services and stuff. But like the other day when I was, I was here, I think, and I was looking at my in-laws, like they have cable. And so I went to the Lifetime channel. And it's crazy when you see like, you know, the movie playing and then what's playing next. It's just all like psycho mama, like <laughs> daddy's going to get you, you know, all these things. And you're like, oh my God. Psycho babysitter. Psycho, psycho mom. Psycho babysitter. Yeah. So honestly, the au pair nightmare was like way better. We thought that it was going to be something totally like ridiculous. That's actually not that bad. It doesn't give no. away the whole, it doesn't give away the whole plot in the in the title. No. you know. Yeah, and that's the other thing too, because ours is is a twist on the whole, the whole genre. You know, the whole like baby crazy nanny from hell situation. But, but yeah, so he, I mean, him and his him and his writing partner Chris, they wrote the movie in like a couple of weeks, I think, and uh, they loved it. And um, it's based on a true story. Parts of it are based on a true story. Um, happened to joe <laughs> joe was the off pair nightmare um but yeah no it, it was a it was just a quick film like it, it timing worked out perfectly because he told me about it like oh he told me about it in like june of 2018 because it was right before i got married and then based on like getting it worked out there's a lot of like foreign investors and stuff so they have to approve the script and all these things so by the time they shot it was may of 2019 so it was almost a year later um, and I was just ran, I was just finishing on Lion King. I finished in June. Um, Celebrating so your one year anniversary. One year. Yeah, exactly. That's so just crazy. Cause I technically haven't been unemployed since August of last year, which is nuts. Anyways. Um, some of that was by choice though. Just want to throw that out there. It's not because I can't get <laughs> <Whatever>. work. <laughs> okay. well, hey, it must be nice to just be able to take off of work for a year. And just, you know, I is making all kinds of money now. Dude. She's my sugar mama. It's awesome. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so uh, that was just like a crazy, they shot that movie in like 10, 14 days, I guess, um, in New Mexico. Where'd you guys shoot your movie? Connecticut. 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 Oh, that must have been nice. Connecticut. I love Connecticut. It was very nice. It was nice. Yeah. Was. How, does, um, how does it compare cutting a, a Lifetime movie to a studio thing? I, I mean, they're all the same. Less, less shots to cut, right? Well, there is there is that. We definitely have less coverage and things. But honestly, Joe, one of the nice things that, you know, and I think it's why Joe and I have been working for so long is we, we have such a good shorthand with each other and we kind of the same kind of movies influence us and we kind of have the same taste and stuff. And so usually, because I'm a, I'm a very strong believer in, as an editor, in the rule of thought of like, I don't like going to set and I don't like hearing about like what it took to get a shot or a take or whatever, because I just want the footage to speak for itself versus like the director being like, Oh, it took us all day to get the shot. So you got to throw it in the movie. I'm like, well, yeah. if it works and it makes sense or whatever. Um, so like with, with, you know, Joe's movie, the different, you know, to answer your question, Johnny, like there's not really a difference between each, you know, the kind of corny, like, like, um, not ridiculous but the corny answer is like as the editor like they're all the same because your job there is to just like it's for the story and the characters and like that's it like your job is just tell the best story you can tell with what you have granted studio films you usually have more to work with and you have better you know equipment and you have better performances sometimes and, and things like that and 
But in terms of the support system, like you have to, I'm sure the studio you have all these other people that are supporting you. You'd have assistance. With this other always, one, it, yeah. I mean, yeah, like on, on Au Pair, like, you know, like going from Lion King, which like I said, it was, you know, two editors, three assistant editors, two visual effects editors, and a music editor going from that to literally just me doing everything. You know, I, I went from like, the only thing I didn't do is there was a DIT on set. So he captured all the footage and converted it. But, you know, I brought it all in a project. I created a project. I did all the temp sound, all the, you know, everything like that. You know, I didn't do like the final mix obviously, but that wouldn't happen on a studio film either or the DI. But, you know, I did all the dailies organizing. I created the project, how I do it. Like, I was responsible for all the outputs and all, you know, sending stuff to the producers and all that. Um, but I will say probably because I haven't edited like a studio film, but I just know from experience and stories and, and stuff you hear is I will say the flip of, of working on a big studio film, the positive flip to a, a smaller film, like a lifetime movie is less interference from outside people. So like, you know, luckily I was working with Joe who is the writer director and so we kind of did our own movie and we had producers who I think when Joe was making the movie, they were a little worried about it being because Joe, Joe and I are big horror movie fans. And I think initially they were worried that he was going to make it a horror film. But when you read the script, it's super, you know, it's super like tongue in cheek and it's a very aware kind of movie. It knows what kind of movie it is and it hits all those kind of lifetime beats. Um, so like, but like Joe had fun with it. Joe and Chris had fun with it. And so when they shot the movie, like, they didn't shoot anything that would make it seem like a horror movie, but I think the producers were really worried about it for a while until they saw like the first cut. Um, and they had notes for us and we did like back and forth on notes, but ultimately like the movie that actually ended up playing on lifetime was, it was actually a couple minutes long because our director's cut was actually a little shorter <laughs> than the producer's cut. Cause they have, it has to be a specific amount of time for like commercial breaks and all that stuff. Um, but like they did change some scenes, but they were very weird scenes that they changed. Like, cause I, I actually ended up going out of town. So I wasn't able to do the final tweaks on the, on the movie. So the producers had someone else do some tweaks, but it, it wasn't like the movie that played is like 90, 98% our film. Like in terms of what Joe and I sat down to do, um, there's just some really minor little changes. Like they just like would swap out a shot or they would pull like some quick, like couple frames off something. Oh, it's very, the, like, I don't the, really know the rhyme or reason the, to it. The filmmakers worked really hard on that job. That's true. We, we <laughs> all did. We all did. <laughs> and they told the editor. Um, hey, Ian, what's, uh, and there might not be anything, what's one thing that you wish actors knew a little bit more about your job huh. that maybe would make things a little easier? Mm, that's a good question. Um, like blink lesser one well one one thing that i think about a lot um and it's not really like for the you know one of the things we we try to do is like you know the the power of the scene coming back to us and you're like the power of the scene should be enough you know in terms of the context and the, and the and the emotions and what the characters are doing that like any kind of technical issues you would hope would be kind of just they would be distracted against you know and people wouldn't notice them and one like, of those like big what? ones is like continuity errors. Um, and that happens a lot, especially I, you know, we notice it because we look at the footage all day, every day and have seen everything a million times. And so like, we are so aware of everything happening on the screen at once. Obviously most viewers will never, you know, they'll see something one time and they'll, they'll never watch again. So they don't really notice it. So I guess like one thing that I would say that I, I pick up on and I go like sometimes when it comes to the actors is like, you know, different takes there. And again, it's not always your guys' fault because there's the blocking and there's all these kind of things too, but it's like how many times like you guys do the same thing, but it's just not the same way, you know, like the, I'm, like I'm the trying cups, to like, I'm, yeah, I know like the cups in this hand or yeah. You, yeah. Like, yeah. And even that, I don't know, like, again, there's should be people on set who should be continuity and the script supervisor and all that stuff. But um, I would say that's a definitely one thing I can say like performance wise it's I, I I it's not my place to like tell an actor how to do something or say something you know that's the direct here's here's your stuff. chance though dude. dude I'm like you fuckers you, you assholes <laughs> now's my chance so, so um, that actually gave you a, another question so I've heard I don't know if it was maybe it was Tom Hanks I'm not sure who was talking about it but 
how do you feel about when you're cutting a movie together? And I, I get what you're saying, like the continuity, the performance and different things for everything should essentially be the same. So the wide matches the tight and all that stuff. Essentially. Yeah. Yeah. At least at least close. Right. Yeah. Um, now, how do you feel about like if every take they do, whether it's wide, medium, tight, the performance is different every single time. Um, how do you cut that? I mean, thing? I think yeah. that, that, I mean, obviously you'd think that if that was the case, that would be something like the director was happy with or aware of. And maybe that's something like the actor discusses. I've heard stories like you're saying, Tom Hanks. I've heard a lot of stories of, Tom of Hanks actors who would like every take they would do it. Completely they, they try different. to do something else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to, we actually, a man and I, we were just listening to uh, Chris Cooper. He was on uh, WTF with Marin and he was talking about Chris that. Cooper's like, so good. He's amazing. And he's like, it's great. I love listening to actors when they're like in their element because you're like, Oh, I love him as an actor. And like, he's a good guy. He's not like a fucking asshole. Like you hear so many stories about, but he just, he just plays one. He was taught. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the thing. We were like tripping out. Cause you know, it's like, he's always like such a serious, yeah. he's always like the villain or he's just like a really not nice guy or whatever. The evil he was, like, a really like legit nice dude. Um, but he was talking about that. Cause he was saying, I think he was talking about adaptation um, when he did that and he was saying basically like every time they would do a scene every take he would do it differently because he would do it from a different perspective so like you know i don't know if you guys are familiar with that movie but the idea is yeah. he's like he's like the flower he's like the uh ner- what's the term for it like the flower grower botanist kind of guy in florida and meryl streep's just like really like successful news reporter in new york and she goes down to do the story on this orchid that he's dealing with and so like he would talk about working with Spike Jones, you know, the director, like one take would be like, he is so intimidated by her because she's from New York. So he'd be very like, like less is more in his performance. And then the next take, he would be like fascinated by her and be like more like warm to her. And then another take, he'd be totally like, who the hell is this person? Like, you know, I'm this redneck from Florida and this like, you know, elite person from New York's coming down to tell, like, ask me about my work. Like, how dare they? So like he'd be more standoffish and kind of like that. So I think that's kind of cool. Cause obviously that's something that the director and him work about work, you know, work on and you know, the other actors in the scene are aware of. Um, the thing is that just sounds like uh, differences, keeping it fresh for like emoting. It doesn't sound like he'd be doing a bunch of different stuff that would. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I would say like, if if an actor is going to like physically be doing different stuff, you know, like if one scene you're doing something with a bottle and the next scene you're like doing something, you know, whatever, like, I would at least hope there'd be some more coverage and just like the one angle of that, you know, like the one take angle of that. Um, but I will say like in terms of performance kind of changing and evolving and not necessarily always being consistent. Cause you know, it's like, yeah, it's great to have consistency and to have like a lot of material to work with that is kind of coming from the same place, but at the same time, and I know you guys have edited stuff before, like, or worked with editors, like, it's also amazing how stuff can come together from different pieces and it's not, you wouldn't think it would work or you would, you're kind of, it's, you're like, well, this isn't the same kind of tone or whatever, but when we kind of put it together, it kind of takes on like a shape of its own thing. Um, so like, I do think like it is good to have a little variety in, in the performances and stuff like that. It, again, it's just more like my ADD, like continuity of, like saying a line as they like do this and then the next take they like do this and then they say the line and you're like well shit like what am i supposed to do with that you know so you must hate scorsese movies no i don't how dare you (laughs) that's all that's all by choice that's not you know let's not get ahead of ourselves it's all it's intentional it's intentional exactly well he favors the performance and the storytelling rather than the continuity yeah you know it's good i mean like but that's the thing like you you know thelma his editor forever who's you know a god she like it's like she knows you know they obviously have their shorthand and they do what they do but like she makes it work it always works because yes there are times where like stuff does not you know how many times have we seen scorsese films where like there's always continuity issues and there's always like and yet so rewatchable but yeah like it doesn't it like helps it, it like plays into the film it's it doesn't affect know. the story yeah it doesn't. No, it's very it's, yeah that's it's a like whole when, other it's thing. like when leo in wolf of wall street was going through his drug trip there was tons of continuity issues in that and that kind of played that into was it. like yeah that was like kind of like the style mm. yeah well there's yeah i mean like i think like 
Gangs in New York, there's a lot of, and I, I, I love that movie. Dude, that movie is, that might be one of my top Scorsese films. Honestly. I've seen it so many times. And yeah. Like, you know, all his movies are long and I've seen every one of his movies like at least five times and it's just incredible. But what did you think about Silence? Did you see Silence? I love Silence. Okay. I loved it. I only saw it one time because it is really long and very drawn out. Well, it's, yeah. But I just want to hear what you thought about it. Well, it's, it's crazy that movie because like, on paper, it's it's like a three and a half hour movie. It's in Japanese, <laughs> and it's a well, like got, se- it's like seventeenth century period. Yeah, Andrew Garfield and Adam Driver. So like, yeah. there's English in it, but like, and it's like a, a period seventeenth century period piece. And you're just like, and it's about religion. And you're just like, what, what, you know? <laughs> but because he made it, you're like, okay. But I've only seen it once too, and I remember like it was like I I watched it because it was like. I was homesick one day and it was like the afternoon i'm like well this is the only time i'm gonna watch this movie like i'm not gonna want to do this and you know worst case is like fall asleep and take a nap in the movie from like a you know, day quilt overdose or whatever but like i was like riveted and sucked in and like the three and a half hours like blew by you know because you just get you know those movies you just get so sucked into everything going on and like holy shit where'd the time go you know um I mean, that was how it was like with Irishman. I know Johnny and I saw that. And I remember like, I'm glad we saw it at like two in the afternoon or whatever it was. So when it was over, it was still like light out and stuff. But I remember yeah. like, man, three and a half hours. That is a long time to be sitting there. Just dude, like, I saw that movie three times. So. Yeah, dude, two days later, I watched it again. Cause I thought like, I love the different scenes. So many yeah, good scenes. Good, dude. They, had a, yeah. they had another screening at the, at the Egyptian and Thelma was there oh. um, after to do like a Q and A about the movie. It was, it was really interesting. Yeah, I love her. I was at um, when I went to the Ace Awards, which is like the editing award show, um, a couple of years ago. When Mark, my the editor for Jungle Book, he was nominated, and um, that year, that that show that year was when they were giving uh, Thelma the like Lifetime Achievement Award. So it was like crazy because like Marty was there and like introduced her, and then she came out, and it was just like I, I filmed like so much of it because I was just like. I'm in a room with Martin Scorsese, like, and Thelma, and they show this, like, really cool, like, you know, sizzle montage reel they put together for, and, like, uh, it, it's, it's that kind of stuff, because you're, like, holy, like, I'm here because of you guys, because I grew up watching your movies, and now I'm, like, in the same room. It's it's just a weird thing, but he's he's the best, man. I'm I'm always looking forward to what he's doing next. It's and, weird when you hear her talk, and she, how she kind of says, like, I didn't really want to be an editor. Like, no. She's, like, I'm not really, not something I really want to do or wanted to do. Just what you want to be? Fell into it. Yeah. What you want to be? A stay-at-home mom? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. <laughs> well, you know you're gonna be getting a call pretty soon from well, her. You can come break your leg. Dude. Well, I didn't say that's all women can do. I just that's a very important job, and we shouldn't trivialize being a mother. Sorry. We've had a lot of calls from Aaron's statements on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've had to redact a lot of comments on this podcast. No, what we, you, we what the producers do not uh, recognize Aaron's comments. What did Thelma want to be though? I don't know what she wanted to be, but I, I know they met like in film school or something. About film, film school, school yeah. yeah. And like ever since then, she's been cutting his stuff. So, um, I mean, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's one of those things. It, it happened with um, Sally Menke and who was Quentin Tarantino's editor until she, she tragically passed away. She had that terrible freak accident. But she did, you know, I don't think she did, did she, I can't remember. I don't think she did Reservoir Dogs. She did Pulp Fiction all the way to, uh, she did um what's it inglorious was her last one and then she passed away and like you i personally i haven't other like once upon a time in hollywood was a masterpiece but like i'm not the biggest fan of Django, and i'm not the biggest fan of hateful eight and Dude, like, you watch yourself bro i like hey, i'm just saying nobody's actually, a big fan of hateful eight but no, actually, J- hateful eight was the i thought the worst tarantino film in my opinion like yeah. it's not it's, it's not a bad movie no like, no for sure it's just, just a Tarantino movie. I mean, exactly. let's not get crazy. No, no. Django, Django is good. Django, I, like, I love. I, I love Django. Django. Yeah. Well, the thing, the thing I'll say though is, the pacing. You like to me personally when I watch those films. Like when she passed away, I my immediate thought, and I don't know if it's fucked up or not. I, it's like I was like, well, like I'm really curious what the next Tarantino movie is going to be like because it's not going to. I guarantee you, it will not have the same style and and everything. And I'm not, I, I don't know who, I should be careful what I say because I don't, I can't remember who cut Django and all that. But, it was just different. It wasn't the same. Yeah, it, it, it was just more of a curiosity. And that, that was what I was, my point I was trying to make with Thelma and Marty. It's just like, I don't know. I don't want to live in a world where like 
there isn't a Martin Scorsese film not edited by Thelma. And, and so it, it is very interesting. You have like Michael Kahn and Spielberg and you have a lot of these collaborations. Michael Kahn is still doing Spielberg's work, but he now is a co-editor. So I think it's kind of a passing of the baton, if you will. Um, but it, it is one of those things where like, you know, when you have these, these like famous, you know, great, amazing, revered, acclaimed directors, like, it's you know and i'm not it's not just the editors it's it's all the people behind the camera who are like and in you know obviously actors in front of it who like who have worked with these people repeatedly you develop this shorthand and this style and this whole workflow that just obviously just benefits the end product every time and so it's like you have these great teams that you know the, these pairs or whatever and so it is kind of incredible to to think about like like with Thelma and Marty, like what would have happened if they didn't meet? Like you could almost argue that Marty probably wouldn't be Marty if it wasn't for Thelma and those kind of things. Um, so yeah, and you know, that's, that's one of the reasons I love editing so much is it's just, I love the whole puzzle pieces. You know, you get, you get all the pieces on a table in front of you and you got to put the puzzle together. And it's just, it's crazy how all the little bits and pieces come together and then they create this big picture thing, you know? So talking about passing the baton, like, Obviously, you have, like, these greats, like, you know, Spielberg, Tarantino, Scorsese, all these huge giants that have essentially almost created Hollywood in this weird way. Mm -hmm. Who are some people that – because they're not going to be around forever. Mm -hmm. Like, who, who are some directors or some filmmakers coming up that you think are going to sort of take that baton off? That's a good question. Um, trying to think of, like, some of the film – like, there's a lot of directors right now that I – I mean, there's people who are – I mean, it's hard because, like, some of my favorite directors are just, like, still those guys. I mean, Guillermo del Toro obviously comes to mind. What about um, Damien Chazelle? He's all right. I mean. Whoa, dude. <laughs> <laughs> the most controversial I mean, no, statement because, ever. <laughs> because I literally, I would just literally just get, like, yesterday we were, I'm at my in-laws and, like, they were, we were talking about some, like, they were talking about musicals and stuff. and Talked about La La Land? Whoa, I, actually, like, I actually wasn't a fan of that movie, honestly. I mean. I it's okay. It. Whiplash. It's awesome. was good. It's a good. Whiplash but, uh, was great. But you know, like, there's a lot of stuff about that movie where I'm like, there's this, I, there's this, me like, to me, the message at the end of that movie, it's a very weird, you know, because this whole, like, and I haven't seen it in a while, but I saw it when it came out, and I'll get back on answering your question. But you got me on a tangent now, Johnny. So <laughs> now he said, said box, I didn't say anything. He said it. Uh, <laughs> the people want to know. Um, it's just like you know the whole like. You know, they and I, I don't remember everything about the movie, but I just remember like she's trying to do, she's trying to be an actress, I think, right? She's trying to do this like play, this one woman stage show, and she finally gets it all together because of him, and he doesn't show up, and then she kind of just like throws it out the window, and she's like defe defeated by it, kind of. If I if I'm remembering that correctly, I know she becomes an actress later on, like in the time jump forward, but it was a weird, very weird message where she was like. I don't know. It was, I don't know. Well, and she, she wasn't discouraged because he didn't show up, although she didn't like, she didn't like that. She was wait, discouraged because it was like a failure. Nobody showed up but except he, the one casting director. Well, he was the one, he was the one who brought her back from her home, her hometown back to LA saying, Hey, this casting director saw you in the show and wants to contact you or something. All right. Well right. then let's just take this part out of the podcast. It's like, I don't Dude, like the movie. All right. You I don't fell like asleep. The movie. You fell asleep during the movie. <laughs> but the thing is, when you're an artist, you know, listen, the guy's just giving us his vision. If it was exactly the way we wanted to see it, maybe it wouldn't have been good at all. Well, I, I mean, I got I, nothing. To, uh, what, what's the other one he did? The Whiplash. Like, that Whiplash was, was awesome. That was good. Yes. That was great. And did I, you see, I did, did you see First Man? I didn't. That's the only thing. I, I, I hadn't seen that film. And again, it's nothing against him. I just. I thought that movie was really good. There's so much. It's insane how much stuff comes out now. Like, it's so hard to keep up with stuff. And so you got to, you know, there's still movies I haven't seen that are like, famous 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 movies i've never seen before you know um but yeah i mean like younger filmmakers like i don't know who will be like the next tarantino or like spielberg but like there's a lot of young directors who are like really making a name for themselves like i love um aria aster who did midsummer and hereditary like midsummer was my favorite movie last year like by far for some reason it's just that movie that did you listen to uh I don't, I don't know if you know but a24 has a podcast yeah yeah did you listen to the robert eggers yeah that, i was gonna say robert eggers too like those Dude, two that, guys and i love that they're best friends and everything that conversation life. between the two of them was so like heady and technical 
they know their like, shit, man. I know, they man. Know I, I was like really surprised at like how much they knew about like literally everything. Yeah, they know everything. Super intelligent guys. Yeah. Um, what I was gonna say is, sorry, I just want to make sure I say the name right. There's a guy who did, um, he did like Green Room and oh, uh, that Jeremy, Jeremy Sa- Saunier, Saunier, yeah, something like that. Yeah, Jeremy Saunier. I love. You, like, you I got think, me on him, dude, and I, I watched all of his movies. He's dude. He's fantastic. He's, Wait, what's yeah. a movie? What's a movie? Unbelievable. He did Green Room. He did a movie called Blue Ruin. Um, Blue Ruin. He, he likes did, colors. He and did he did uh, Into the Dark or something. Yeah, like. yeah, the one with Jeffrey Wright. Into that was a cool that movie. That was awesome. That yeah, movie that was, was wicked. That was creepy, like a weird – it was a weird movie. but It, it was, was a really very cool. weird movie. Um, and they also did uh, – uh, it's this great movie called Murder Party. Yeah, I saw that one too. That, it's, like, it's like a really funny, weird movie, but it's like great. Yeah. Making uh, – Macon Blair, who's like the actor in all his movies, I love his that buddy, guy. right? He's like they're friends, they're like good friends, right? Yeah, but he dir- he actually directed the movie. It's called um, "I Don't Feel at Home in This World Anymore." Or something with Elijah Wood and Melanie Lips- Lipsky. Sounds dark. A years ago, it's on it's like a call for help. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like him. I like the Safety Brothers. I think they're really yep, good. Safety Brothers are amazing. What Sorry, they, I'm like what looking at my list. Besides that one, Adam Sandler one. Uh, good time. Um, good times great they movies. actually have done a few yeah. other films i haven't seen the yeah. other films though um i'm like looking at the the lit my list of like because i've been watching keeping track of all the movies i've been watching lately like uh ryan johnson i love ryan johnson name a movie name these movies michael, michael, michael looper. Flanagan. yeah it, ryan it's johnson looper. did looper he did knives out Star Wars. oh yeah that guy yeah, yeah he did uh looper was good. brothers bloom um mike flanagan is amazing he did. He just did Doctor Sleep, but he did like Oculus. I was. I wasn't a fan of Doctor Sleep. I I need to see it again, but yeah. uh, I, I enjoyed it. But I didn't like love it when I first saw it. But I yeah. loved everything else he's done. He's 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 a again. He's one of those filmmakers that just like he just gets it. Like he gets the story, he gets the characters, and he gets like what the audience is feeling and stuff. Um, I'm trying to think. Like I'm looking at my my list of smaller smaller movies um there was a that movie did you guys see i forgot his name um he did uh it's called sweetheart i think it's like a girl who gets stranded on an island and there's like a monster his name's like dj or d something i don't know an yeah. allegory for rape <laughs> okay potentially um I'm i wasn't laughing tra- i'm gonna keep a yeah, track on, let- on letterboxd <laughs> i don't know if you use letterboxd but I've heard everyone tells me I should use it. I have, my brother uses it, but I, I just used it before. it's easy way to keep track of all these movies and stuff. Um, yeah, I know. But anyway, well, like at, like as an editor, like looking at these up and coming directors, like is it in is it out of the question to say like, whoa, I would love to work for these up and comers and be there, Thelma? Is yeah. that how it works? I mean, essentially, like it's all again, you know, with every every aspect of our industry, it's all about like who you know and the networking and it's just like how how does you how does your face you know your headshot in your case or my resume get in front of somebody like that or like somebody who would recommend somebody like that um, in the pizza box the pizza box <laughs> the pizza box what's just, that you put it you put it un- under the lid of the pizza uh, box you know how that's a known joke <laughs> <laughs> is that is that hilarious known antidote joke it's so great you're, you're welcome um <laughs> hey i did want to um before we uh i don't want to like not ask this because you also worked on the uh the judge dude which i really like i like the judge and that was favreau directed that one as well no that was david dobkin who did that uh, one. Oh, uh, was favreau in it no okay well, robert, <laughs> Vince, well, Vince d'onofrio's in it i don't Vince know if that's you're thinking no, of. No, no. Um, robert well, Downey. well i remember King, robert Downey King, King. jr robert but, uh, duvall right duvall yeah he was yes. great in that movie what was um Robert Downey Jr. and actually John Favreau is responsible for helping bring his career back with Iron Man. But like, what was it like editing Robert Downey Jr.? Well, any thoughts? I was a po- <laughs> any thoughts? Any thoughts? <laughs> Your comments? <laughs> uh, I was so I was the post PA on that movie. So that was the first movie I worked on that I met my my editing team like Mark and Mark Lavolsi and Bill Kruzikowski and Dave Matusek, who I've worked with on every film since then, except for the one I edited. Um, so I was a PA on that. You know, like you guys know who, what PAs are. As post PA, it's like the same. It's it's more like downscaled in terms of like I only deal with like six, seven people versus like 
60 or 70 people on a set and it's the usual duties you know like the coffee and the food and the phones and the errands and all that kind of stuff but um i was lucky enough that because i i wanted to be doing editing and and get into post-production and stuff i was lucky to work with a team mark and bill and dave who recognized that and they were really willing to show me stuff and like explain things to me and kind of let me sit in on sessions and stuff like that um like I know with, with Mark, the editor of The Judge, so he was the one who put all those scenes together with Robert and with Downey in them. Like he, I know Downey was, I saw a lot of the dailies and stuff and Downey was great, you know, like as he is, but you know, that's why he's Downey, just super consistent and just, you know, a lot of energy, a lot of different, you know, stuff going on in each takes and stuff to work with. But um, I mean, he was a nice guy. I didn't, I interacted with him and his wife because his wife and him produced the movie. Um, I got to go to their house once, which is pretty cool. Oh, you weren't in his house? I didn't go in, but I got to go inside <laughs> the compound part of it. You know? Was he like, hey, man, that, that's far enough? He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> um, I had to do a drop off there, and like I went in, and like, I mean, his house is like awesome. It, like, up from the outside, you know, it looks like a, it's in Malibu, so it looks like a Tony Stark kind of like all glass. <laughs> house. I heard from the inside, it's a, it's a shit box. Is it true? Maybe, dude. I'm just kidding. Put it all <laughs> looking nice on the outside. Ian wants to know, actually. So he had a bunch true. of uh, he had a bunch of llamas on his property. <laughs> Did he really? Llamas, yeah. Well, Doctor <laughs> Doolittle. Before Dr. Doolittle. yeah, dude, he's doing research <laughs> for Doolittle, bro. <laughs> he, was, he was working on his on his, with his seat partners, man. It's like years years before Doolittle hit. Actually, it's funny that movie was like. I'm like I remember being in the office when they were like that was like one of his next movies he was like getting ready to do. Did you tell him, hey man, maybe you should pass? <laughs> I haven't read the script, but I don't know if the world needs another dude. How do you top Eddie Murphy? Bro? Eddie Murphy's still know. alive, yeah. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> How disrespectful are you, dude? It's not even dead yet, man. But um, <laughs> um about Robert Downey Jr. because I haven't seen Doolittle. I heard he's not that great in it. But every other thing Robert Downey Jr. does is great. And even though the judge, I thought it was great. But it surprised me. I can't remember if he said this on Howard Stern or recently in the past year or two. He made it known that he uses like an earpiece sometimes where somebody else feeds in his lines. Did he really say he said that on a radio? Yes, thing? he did. Yeah. He did? Was it Howard Stern? You guys aren't baiting me, are you right now? <laughs> okay. I, I heard it publicly. It was probably Howard Stern. It, he, okay. he said it publicly. All right. All right, I'm trusting you boys here because I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> I didn't know if it's public knowledge. But, but, but what I'm saying is his performance well, he, he admits- was really oh, good yeah. in that movie. No, yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't know if he does it in all movies. And it, it seems to be, I don't know if you guys being actors, you've heard stories. It seems to be kind of a common thing. And a lot of actors do that, which I don't know how they do it. But I, I didn't know. I don't know how common that is. But, it, but I, I think like I know Johnny Depp, at least for a while there like i think later i'd like to think the early days johnny depp was actually like committed to the craft because he's so good you know (laughs) sorry he had an abusive wife yeah yeah (laughs) the abusive johnny depp i don't give a shit as much about you know in terms of how he does this thing and i haven't seen any of his movies in a while but um but like when we did the reshoots uh for the judge like the pickup shots and all the stuff like that was kind of when i started because i came on late in that show they were already well into like the film being done um, but they had to do reshoots and stuff and the PA I replaced, he, he was leaving early. So that's why I, I did the job. But, um, they definitely was like, I remember I was on set one day and I like put two and two together because I was like standing next, like standing away from the set where they were shooting on the stage. And then like, there was this guy sitting next to me in a chair with a walkie talkie, like saying a line. And then all of a sudden I'd hear Robert Downey saying it, you know, like 30, 40 feet away. And I'm like, it's a, a couple of times I was like, does he give the full line or just he gives a full line yeah so i don't know I, you'd think it would be super distracting i can't even imagine yeah. if it's like it seems really hard to go on one ear and like because you know it's like the timing and like, yeah it seems know, like it'd be bad for inflection and everything like that um but like that that's also it's kind of a funny story is like that was you know when when i because I, I started so late in the show but like when they were doing that when they started the post on the judge you know like you have someone who goes through a script and looks at the script and kind of marks like, okay, this will be a VFX shot. This will be a VFX shot and kind of breaks it down that way. You know, like all departments in, in the industry, like there's certain departments have to figure out like when they're going to come in. Um, and I think like that movie, when the first pass through on the VFX shots went through it, it was like a couple 
dozen VFX shots, you know, other than like the basic, like, oh, the green screen, you know, back plates in the background or whatever like that, like removal of these or that. But like by the end of that show, the shots, the green, like the VFX shots had like ballooned because there was so much of like removing the earbud from. Right. It, it wasn't side. Howard Stern. I looked it up. What was it on? He, it was he, you. You just said it right now. Breaking. <laughs> <laughs> Ian McLaren. Fire. No, no, it was on Howard Stern. All right, cool. Yeah, uh, uh, I can imagine the reason he did that because he's had so many other projects, right? Is yeah, I whole, think so. I think you know? that would be my guess. Like, you know, it's just like, you know, so many scripts coming across your de- desk, and there's like stuff you're in production on and stuff you're about to go into and stuff you just finished. So I'm sure it definitely probably helps. But there's part of you that goes like, dude, you get paid like a lot of money to yeah. do this. Like, could you maybe? Just- I wonder if he ever gets confused and he starts doing the delivery and it's like, whoa, it's not Iron Man, dude. And it's like, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, oh, my, oh, my bad. Um, yeah. My bad, cool. Cap. <laughs> okay. So now with, uh, with everything going on in the world, everything is yeah. unknown, especially this industry, dude. What are you, what are you planning on doing? Like what's. Dude, I'm, you see this beard. Celebrate you've, had, you've, had, <laughs> you've had the beard for a while though man i know this is so fun. well you probably um, got your second anniversary coming up or just passing so you know yeah that's true um i don't know man it's uh it's weird right now like same thing i know you guys like i know johnny you've been booking some like audiobook stuff and you guys just did a lifetime movie i i feel like basically from what i understand like if people were working on something at least in my field in post-production before the pandemic and the like lockdown hit basically anyone I knew who was working on something is still working on it. It's just from home now. So like my wife or like my team on on Lion King, they're all doing Mandalorian and like, you know, there's just a lot of people who are still like in post. They can do a lot of the stuff from home. I mean, production is obviously the thing that's going to be the most affected by the production and then the delivery of like, how are these things going to eventually be released? Cause it sounds like movie theaters may be going bye bye here um not really I, but, I, hope, I hope not dude a lot of them are probably gonna go well like the the three alamo draft houses in phoenix they all they're all gone now are they're they completely gone gone. gone like yeah they're are they're you bankers. fucking serious yeah, dude? dude it's like uh, damn man but they're so only like oh god it took it. forever to get that one in los angeles like please don't go like please don't go away it took like five years isn't alamo draft house somebody like mark and anna i think anna told me that alamo draft houses were like bad or something like their, well, their well, owner it, yeah their owner was like bigoted or something? No, know. there's all kinds of like. Well, so the one in Tempe close too? Yeah, ten, well, all three of them, yeah, because they're all owned by the same. Because like those are franchised out; they're not owned by like Tim, like Tim League's the guy who started it in Austin, and like he did all the ones in Austin. And then I think at some point they started branching out, and then like the other parts of Texas, and then that's when they started like, oh, we could franchise. So the ones in Arizona are actually like owned by some local Phoenix yeah. businessmen. Um, so yeah, the Tempe one fell under that window too i don't know like in in terms of like the uh the bigoted stuff like i i think again it's just like it seems like to be everything in this day and age where like somebody something is a scumbag and a terrible human being i don't care if the ceo of a movie theater uh doesn't care for gay people just like (laughs) like i care about gay people and gay rights but i just personally don't care if i go and sit in the theater that's that's your privilege buddy i just got (laughs) fucking like banned from this industry (laughs) I don't think I don't think he was the one who was bigoted. There was other people involved. Like my brother, actually, he worked he worked at the one in Chandler, Arizona, for for years, and like he had heard some stuff too. But like I know, like a lot of people from corporate, like Tim League, including like he went to every location and kind of was like, "This is what's going on," but like we want you to know, like this is what's happening and all this stuff. So, um, but anyways, yeah. What, sexual harassment and all that fun stuff. <laughs> no <laughs> more gray, movies. So that gray area. <laughs> um, like right now it's, it's weird, man. Like um, in terms, again, I can only speak for like posts and editorial. Like me personally, I don't know what I'm doing next. I don't know what's going to happen. Like, you kind know, of exciting. Are you guys going to keep traveling or are you guys, are you well, yeah, where the hell are we going to go? We're not allowed <laughs> to leave this country. No other country wants us. Anymore. Hey man, you can, you can drive. Yeah, you can take dude. a long road trip. And like you are weirder. Yeah, like, <laughs> like what the hell are we gonna hey do? Hey man, just go where the wind takes you. That's it. Put on Dude, those VR thought, goggles and go wherever. 
Dude, we stopped in Utah on the way up here because we drove like two You throw on this podcast and just ride. <laughs> just repeat for like <laughs> My wife's like, no! <laughs> we get enough of this shit. Um, it's just weird, man. It's just like, because, you know, like Johnny is alluding to it, like my wife and I made a conscious decision last year when we both, because I finished Lion King and she finished season two of Mindhunter. And we were just like, we had both been working nonstop for a while and we were just like, we want to travel. And so we just consciously decided to stop working in August and we were like, we're going to take the rest of the year off and just do whatever we want to do. And we did that. And the plan was always like, all right, around March is when we're going to start <laughs> going back to work. Amanda, like she had this job with Marvel lined up already because they've been trying to get her for a while. And so she started in February and I like just started to go, like I started sending my resume out in March. I started, I went to like a couple meetings and stuff like that just to kind of be like, all right, what's going on? And then this happened. And like, since then it's been silence. I haven't heard anything for months. I ironically in the last week, I've heard a couple of things. People reach out to me about some stuff. Um, but I mean, everyone is working from home now in terms of my world. Like my editor friends, my assistant editor friends, like post coordinators, post supervisor, my visual effects, people I know who work in visual effects, like all that can be done from home. And that's something that I think is very unique because for so long, you know, Hollywood and, and the industry has done things the way they've done them. And they haven't really, other than the technological change and stuff, like there hasn't really been any like discernible, like noticeable change and how things are made. It's just basically like, you know, scripts written, you know, whatever, pre-production, shoot, post, blah, blah, blah. And there's always the crazy schedule and this kind of bookends how we started the conversation where it's like, there's always inevitably all these crazy things at the very end of a movie that happen every time. And there's money that needs to be made, thrown at at the problem and more people and all this stuff. So movies are always made the same way. There was actually an article Amanda showed me the other day that it was an editor who wrote it. And it's basically saying like, Hollywood doesn't want to go back to normal because normal was not working for us. It's, you know, in terms of our work, you know, our, we're the only, only industry where our standard work week is 60 hours a week before we see overtime. That's not. Oh, so, so, so sorry. So sorry for you, dude, to be working yeah. so many hours. My God. Hollywood hours. Was never well, great. I'm just speaking. I'm the voice of the, of the, the whole collective here. Right. I, I speak on behalf of all. It must all be nice to take six months off, man. It must be great. By the way, I love how both you and your wife finished huge products, projects made a pact to let's do whatever you want. And then you guys decided to go to Utah. <laughs> well, no, Utah was oh, Utah was the, on the drive up here. That was a whole. I was getting a, uh, that was Johnny's like road tripping around in this day and age like an idiot theory. I was just gonna say we went to Utah. And no one was wearing masks, and they were like all like we looked like assholes because everyone was looking at us because we're the only ones wearing masks. Well, they were wearing extra pajamas though. We went we <laughs> we <laughs> we, uh, we we went to like New England. We did like a month road trip in New England. We were in Orlando. Like we went to New Zealand. We did all kinds of amazing stuff before all this happened so ha 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 it was nice all right, <laughs> nice. Okay. you should try it uh, yeah why don't you try so why don't you guys just quit working and try just vacationing for a little while why don't you live a little bit? I'm, be I'm begging for a job right why are you now, so <laughs> you're so obsessed with working you loser i know dude. um yeah so it's just i don't know what the new norm is going to be for us man i mean it's like the first time in our lives and it's not just our industry. It's the whole world where like everything's just been put on pause, you know, like we've all have been put on pause, whether we like it or not. And obviously some of us are in way better positions than other people. Like I don't want to take anything away, especially in this country. There's so many people in this country who are like, you know, they have bills to pay, they have feet, you know, families to feed and they, they don't know, like they, you know, they live paycheck to paycheck. And so the people like us who like, and again, by us, I just mean my wife, because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I'm Wait. living the high life. Right? <laughs> Way to rub it in. Yeah. Saving all um, the haircut money. Yeah, I, <laughs> that's the thing. That's our, we have, I just haven't been cutting my hair or anything, dude. Look at there this. There you go. I don't need a shave. I don't want to pay for razors. Extra, those blades always are the, that's where they get you, those extra blades. That's true, man. They rip you off. They rip you off, dude. That's why they um, lock them up at the store. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's just, I would like to think that, I would like to think, but again, I don't know again. It's like, I hope that because of this like pause in this moment where everyone's kind of reevaluating, like, I mean, we're all living day to day at this point. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, let alone next week, next month, the rest of this year. And I think we've seen clearly like studios have been like, oh yeah, we're going to release this movie, this, this, you know, on this date. And then it's like, oh, no, 
maybe next month. And they, you know, it keeps changing. And like, I can only speak for Amanda, but I'm sure it's everywhere too, where it's like, you know, they have resh- they have pickups and reshoots they got to do. And those keep getting pushed. And all the productions over the last four or five months that were supposed to go into effect haven't gone into effect. And now there's this whole thing where like, you know, all these, you know, all this stuff is booked way in advance. You know, these studios book stages and equipment and crews like way in advance. Cause they're, you know, it's all, they all got to figure out like where the production stagger and how they can work alongside each other and not use all the resources. But, like when things are okay. And like, how is everyone going to just be able to like jump on, you know, like everyone's going to be basically like trying to get the same stage and the same equipment and the same schedule at the same time. And like, that's obviously not going to work. So some stuff's going to have to change when this is all done. Um, but I would like to think at least in terms of my side of the field, the post and the editorial workflow. And I, I can speak because I see it firsthand with the people I know, like it's infinitely different. I mean, obviously it's great to be in a, in an office where you have, you know, access to your director who can, you know, as an editor, it's not always great to have an, a director who can just come in your room whenever he wants. Cause sometimes you just want to be left alone to work and not like have, you know, not have them hovering around you. But in terms of like, the assistant editors or your team who's around you where you need to get stuff done. It, you know, you just walk down the hall and say, Hey man, can you, you know, turn the scene over or whatever? Like, Hey, I need you to fix the, the sound levels in the scene or whatever. So like, obviously the shorthand there, sorry guys, my the light is just like perfect. Yeah. Very artsy. Um, there we go. Um, like in terms of, of all that, like it's great, but you know, now that like we're all working from home and like, you know, you have these big, movies and tv shows that are finishing with the entire team from home remotely patched into whatever like it's getting done it's all getting done like our industry is showing like showing the the old ways aren't necessarily the only way to do things anymore um and so i think that's exciting in a lot of ways and you know we like for people especially like i have friends who you know, they have kids and they work these jobs. So it's like, they don't see their kids ever because, you know, they leave early in the mornings and they come home late at night and their kids, you know, so they see them a couple days a week or whatever. Now they're upset. They got to see them all the time. Well, I know. And that's the thing. It's easy for me to say, cause I don't have kids. So, but like now they're seeing them all the time, which, you know, I'm sure some days is awesome. And some days they're like, please just go away for a little while. We don't want to be near you. Um, but I don't know. I, I think that it's 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 in, it's interesting for for our industry for sure um and i know again it's easy for me to say because i'm not on set like you guys are so i don't know how it's going to affect you guys i've heard like crazy stories like i know sam neil was recently talking about they're like going to do the next jurassic park they're about to shoot it and then they went into lockdown and now i guess they're like one of the first big studio movies to like go back into production and he said they're like all the cast is going to be staying quarantining in a house together for like, they're all just going to be living in this house together while they shoot this movie. And like Amanda's talked about some stuff, you know, I don't know if you guys have been following like the kind of the guidelines that the industry has been releasing out the last couple of weeks, you know? Yeah. They've been dropping different things for SAG and stuff like that. Yeah. Like our unions have all been like working in their own way and trying to figure stuff out and what makes the most sense. And it's crazy when you see some of the stuff, knowing how we make stuff now or before all this, like you're like, what do you mean? Like there's like certain, you know, certain areas where only certain people can be and like, you know, it's all these kind of, but it's just kind of like, well, it's just what we got to do. But it's like I now think, the, the dinosaurs and the humans are going to be CGI. I mean, Hey, right. They got, they got, they got AI robots and not playing leads in movies. So, I mean, you guys know better than anyone, the voice work though. That's where it's at anyways. Right. So, Hey, like, keep that Still going. keep doing that. So keep, keep doing yeah. that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's interesting i don't know i I, like i don't really know what's going to happen or what the new norm is like none of us do but i do think like just seeing what i've seen and know the last few months of just seeing how stuff that we were already told could not happen by studios you know whether it's oh we can't have all the secure stuff in the in you know in the ether and like there's no way we can have these avid machines at your personal house with all this you know security high risk stuff is sensitive material on like they figured out a way to do it because they had to, because it was just necessity as the mother of all invention. So it's kind of interesting to see what's going to happen next here, you know? So I just have two last questions for you, dude, and you can get the hell out of here. (laughs) Um, One question, just because we do have a lot of filmmakers in the, uh, in the audience, if someone wants to do what you do, 
what's the best path to get that? And the second question I have is why the hell haven't you edited any of our movies? We can't afford him. I was going to ask oh. if Johnny ever reached out to him. <laughs> no, I reached out to him plenty of times, dude. <laughs> his, rate, his rate's too high, probably. Well, the last time, the last time he asked me, I wasn't editing it, but it was the I had I did have technical issues that one time. Oh, sure, dude, sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, dude, you see the way I'm living now. Why the hell would I start dude, working dude, when I can just live like, like this? Jungle Book or yeah, exactly. If we're on, uh, jobs on Disney, I think you'd pick that. Uh, no, actually, I, I love I love doing short films, and I love I to me that's kind of like my bread and butter. I mean, that's just because again, it's the same thing, it's the same attitude and you know approach to those a three minute short versus a ninety minute film. It's the same idea. You're still telling a story, and you're doing your best as as the editor to do it. And Johnny, I would love to edit anything, <laughs> anything you guys do. I will see. You'll see. Well, Johnny's you know, a great you know, director. Like, it fits in with my current quarantine, like hanging out doing nothing schedule. But you know, <laughs> we could probably work something out. Um, but yeah, so in terms of like doing what I do, like you know, I went I went to film school, being like I want you know I grew up like making my own little movies, doing my little stupid little stories, you know, writing or whatever. So you know, I think I did what most people did going into film school. Like I want to write and direct my own thing. I want to be you know a filmmaker, a storyteller, blah blah blah. And you start doing it and it's, it's one thing to, you know, make some home videos in your backyard, but then when you're like in school and there's deadlines and there's, you know, certain things you got to do and all, like you start to realize like, you know what, I don't really like this part of it or I'm not really good at this or whatever. And then the beauty of being in film school is you work on other people's sets because you have to and you do other kind of jobs and all this stuff. So I didn't go into school knowing I wanted to be an editor. I didn't, I basically graduated my last year of school there. I was like, I want to be an editor. I just loved, I loved the, the creative and the creating, like I said earlier, the puzzle pieces. Um, so that was kind of like my first thing. I mean, you know, some people go in our industry, like knowing what they want to do and they stick to it. And then like me, I think people go in doing one thing and they kind of, by choice or just by design, they kind of vary off the path. Um, and then there's people who like you guys, like you guys want to be an actor, but you guys, obviously you guys write and direct your own stuff too. Like it, it just kind of naturally happens. Um, for me, like, you know, I met Johnny as a cameraman on a TV show way back in the day. Mm -hmm. RTM, baby. RTM. Um, and like, that was just like, I graduated college and I needed a job. And that was somewhat in the industry, but not really. And it was a great job. Like we met a lot of great people and Johnny and I are obviously friends to this day. And like, we've made a lot of other friends and, and that we're still friends with, but it was kind of like, well, this is cool, but it's not what I want to do. And eventually I just was like, I need to move to LA. I need to at least try it. And I didn't really know what I was going to do. And I w I'm a very rare case. I'm lucky because I got a job like 11 days after moving out there. And it was like, I worked as a post PA on Ender's game. So it was like in the field I wanted to work in too. But that was all because of networking. Like that was because people I went to film school with went to LA first and they met people. And then when I came out there, they passed my resume along. And basically, like, I would say, you know, I know this is a long-winded answer, but it's kind of, it, it really is that old, old kind of wisdom of, like, it's, it's like who you know, and that's, that's true. And it's, like, important to, like, network and get yourself out there and meet as many people as you can. But the flip of that is, like, don't be an asshole and don't forget where you came from. And above all else, like, never think you're too good for a job that you're doing and just give it your all. So it's like, you know, I, I was a post PA for, you know, on several projects over the years. And like the reason I can say the reason I am where I am is because I busted my ass as a PA and did my duties and job on that show to the point that the people in charge noticed it. And then they gave me extra stuff to do that wasn't really under my purview of my job duties. And they gave, they had me doing things that I, you know, that was like editorial wise stuff and things like that. And like, if you, if you do a good job and you commit and you're there 110% and like, even though it sucks, yeah. Like getting coffee fucking sucks after a while. And like getting screamed at for like not having the right salad dressing sucks, you know, those kind of things suck, but you just gotta be like, okay, like I messed, sorry, up. I messed, messed up. up. Yep. I messed up and it won't happen again. And honestly, people, like the good people do recognize that there are inevitably like in the whole world, there's always assholes who are just so far up their own asses and they, you can't do anything to like make them get out of that mindset. 
but you know, like when you own your mistakes and then you fix them and you prove yourself, like, I do think people notice that for sure. Um, so yeah, like that's my advice. It's just really like kind of get yourself out there and network, but it's just like, just do your job good. You know, I'm sure we all know people in this industry and it's, it's frustrating. There's a lot of people who fail upward and it's frustrating because you know, like they, they didn't work nearly as hard as you did or they're not great. Like, you know, I think the key is like, especially in editorial, but it's, it's kind of all jobs and everything. Like you want to be somebody that people want to be around. Like that's the biggest thing I, I know in terms of editorial wise, because you spend so much time together and you spend, it's such high, you know, such a high stressful job and environment. Like things are going to be crazy and, stressful and and ego you know and all this stuff emotions are going to be flying and all this stuff so it's like obviously at the end of the day like at least if that's going to be going on you want to be doing that around people who you like enjoy the who they are like whether it's they're funny or nice or you know whatever it is um so like that's something i've actually been told before where it's like you know it's nice when people are like you're not an asshole i'm like oh that's good to know <laughs> like i'm not an asshole can't believe you lie right like, to your face man <laughs> Hey, you, Hey, asshole, <laughs> not an asshole. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's kind of interesting. Cause I don't know. It's, you, you, we all like have those moments where you gotta, you're kind of put on the spot and you gotta figure something out, you know, and you gotta like, you gotta have an answer and it's not always the right answer, but you're also scared, but like to, you know, whatever it's going to be. But like at the same time, we're all humans and we're all doing a job. And obviously our industry is very like, you, you, there's a lot weighing on you, you know, you, you like, and it's, a lot of times it's not even like for a reason. It's just the fact that you're like on a set or that you're on a big project and you're working with these celebrities and these high profile people. And you're just worried, like, if I screw up once, I'm going to be fired or like, you know, in film school, they always told us like, there's always, you know, a hundred people behind you waiting to like take your job or whatever. And that's something that really sticks with you. So then you're like, Oh God, I can't screw up, but we all screw up. We all make mistakes or whatever. So like owning up to it. And a lot of times people before you've made the same mistakes and they totally understand and they're totally forgiving and they're, they're, you know, most likely cool about it, but it's just really being like, you know, you gotta be cool and you gotta be putting in the, the, the time and the work and all that stuff. So. I guess I don't know if that answers your question. I love it. I thought it was a great answer. Yeah. Johnny, yeah. what do you think? We'll take it. <laughs> um, Fair it enough. Doesn't, it doesn't help me find a job, so. <laughs> stop being an asshole, dude. Dude, you got it. Yeah, stop being an asshole, man. I don't know what to tell you, dude. You're just doing it wrong. It's no problem, man. Anyway, it still doesn't answer why you haven't edited my movies, but that's cool. Oh, well, dude. dude. I mean, no, nah, dude. I, when, if when I made, are we going maybe, into production on the next one, dude? What's maybe, going on there? Maybe if they were better, man. If they were better movies. <laughs> nah, dude. Maybe. I mean, I, I loved the uh, <laughs> movie. Like, that That was a great – like, when you – when when we saw – I saw – I think that's – I don't even know if I met you guys there. I know you guys were at the festival. That was in – I think you came with Brad, right? Yeah, it was Which, Brad. It was, at the, yeah. it was at the Chinese Theater or the TCL or whatever they call it now. But um, I love that movie. For like, Papu? yeah oh cool that was a fun movie right i love that movie and i yeah, like i've good. seen some of the other stuff because that's all i'm gonna think of off the top of my head but i have seen some of, i know you guys have been poor, i feel bad for you've been tagging along with this bastard forever, <laughs> well dude we st i still need somebody to sound mix man i can't find nobody dude <laughs> so uh the last quote i got was too much money so i was Wait, like someone, uh, oh really yeah. Wait, wait, there was, you're paying, dude? You were paying people? I didn't know you were paying. You didn't say that to me. You're like, hey, man, can you do me a favor? No, um, I was going to give you something, but I wanted to see if you could do it first. We're not going to get your Disney right. Really works now, Johnny, now that I know there's money involved, dude. Oh, yeah. I'll, hey, you're, you're $600 an hour. Stop rate, messing with the state work. <laughs> Sorry, dude. Sorry. It's a pen. It's a pen. Oh, okay. um, but yeah, no, I mean, dude, honestly, like, anytime you guys. Even if, even if you want just a second, you know, if you have another editor and you just want like another person to take a crack at it, I'm down. I, I love short films. It, it's really, it's, cause it keeps you going, you know? And it's like, it, there's also like a challenge to it because it's such a short, you know, it's like the time-wise. It's because it's so shitty. It is, so. it's challenging. It's such a shit, shit <laughs> you know? So just really crank those bastards out. It doesn't really matter, but, but yeah, man. Anyway, Next man, we'll, uh, production, let me know. Well, thanks for uh, coming thanks on. Thanks for coming that's on, Ian. Not somebody else has a question, but. Well, I was just going to say, where can our audience find you if they want to follow your journey? 
Or send a resume to you. How do they do that? <laughs> or take my resume. Okay. <laughs> we know Let's John do. listens to this, so if other people are listening to this too, man. Hey, there we go. Um, I mean, right now, like, I don't really – I don't have a website or anything like that. Like I have my IMDb page and then like I have Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, but like, I'm not really, I don't really, I'm not really active. I, I, that's the one thing I'm not is like, cause I'm not an actor and I'm not like a director. So I feel like, I feel it's like, I don't need to be like putting myself out there as much as everyone else does out there. So, you know, the words I just said a few minutes ago about like, get yourself out there. And be known. <laughs> When it comes to social media, you don't need to worry about that. But um, but if somebody did want to find you for a job, just check your IMDb, I guess. Yeah, IMDb. Like, I don't, it's like I wanted to give you my email, but then I'm worried a bunch of people are gonna <laughs> terrible stuff. Rip my my well, PM box. But they gotta um, they gotta buy IMDb Pro, and then your email's listed in there. Well, if yeah, they're I professional, mean, he only wants professional. My first, my first and my last name are in my email, and uh, there's a period in there somewhere, and then at Gmail. But, there you um, go. Yeah, I mean, like I have my red, I have like my LinkedIn and stuff, and like on Instagram and Twitter, I think I'm on my handles like at I M C C L A R R at I McClare. Um, which again, I'm like, why don't I just make it I McClare? Why don't you just make it your name, dude? It's I, I should just start saying like it's my first initial and it's my last name minus E N. But I always like <laughs> very spell confusing. It. People are like, wait, what? Dude, that was my ASU handle. ASU gave me that handle like way back in the day when I started going there. Let, let it go. Let it go, man. Yeah, man, dude. Party for life, bro. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I have stuff on Vimeo, and I have uh, the Au Pair Nightmare right now is, I think, still they play it like once every couple of weeks on Lifetime. So if you guys want to check that out, it's I actually do want to see it. I'll I'd take love it to see it because uh, it's a fun movie. Like, I it's I loved it. I'm Joe and I are incredibly proud of that film for what it is, and it's it's pretty awesome to be like, oh yeah, I edited a feature film that was on television. Oh yeah, dude. Like oh, yeah. people who saw it who weren't my friends or my family who were like going to, oh, <laughs> please well, see my movie. Okay, all right, we'll watch it. So. Lifetime has a big uh, like viewership. Like people who like Lifetime love like watching multiple Lifetime things. Well, it it was great because I, um, man, and I watched it. Like we watched it on some app when it was playing, like just to like see because I we were curious like where are the commercial breaks and all that stuff. But Joe, the director, like he was doing like live tweeting with a bunch i mean when i say a bunch i mean a couple dozen but like hey, there were people who were like watching it and like actively like holy shit that just happened and our that was direct, kind of cool our director encouraged us to live tweet during the oh, premiere because cool. he's like people like that on lifetime i that's did it. cool yeah i mean people people seem to really like it for what it was like i i had never seen a lifetime movie and i had a moment before we started where i was like maybe i should watch a few to kind of get the feel and then i was like you know what i you I just want to like do the best I can do like as a story and, and make it. And that was one of Joe's biggest things is he wanted, you know, when he pitched it to the producers, he was like, I wanted to make it like as cinematic as possible. And I want it to not look and feel like a traditional lifetime movie. Um, but like that being said, like my biggest, my biggest priority was like, A, to have a film that, you know, we're proud of Joe and I and stuff. But like, I just wanted to make sure that the audience was going to be happy with it. That was like my biggest worry. Cause it's like, obviously those movies check boxes and they they're there and they, they do what they do best. So it's like, I didn't want to like <laughs> offend any like lifetime viewers. They're like, what the fuck? This is not, this isn't how this should be, you know? So too cinematic. It seems, yeah. Too, <laughs> too well made. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm not taking yeah. a shot at lifetime movies. I've never seen one of them. So I can't say that, but I mean, part of me is like, man, if I made the, I, I can just make those movies. For the rest i mean i won't say they're, the rest of my career but like those, those I, you can have fun with those films for sure and they're always buying dude they're all yeah and this thing they're always being made exactly it's like shit if i can get a edit of a film every few months like i'm cool with that so as, as long as you're willing for your rates to never go up yeah I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah that, that was definitely one of the things about taking that job it was like oh my first feature film credit as an editor but i was like oh yeah i'm not i'm not getting paid nothing on this movie so. but it's okay it's all good it's you know it's just what you do it's kind of you got to pay it's, it pay it forward a little yeah. bit and it's fun it is fun yeah i mean it was it was the best it was the best for sure so and we're proud of it so but yeah so oh. that's it i guess really the au pair nightmare i don't know what my next like official job is yet stuff's kind of in the works but nothing's official yet and i guess just hanging out at my in-laws house and getting drunk in the middle of the day is kind of where i'm at right now <laughs> Do, doing podcasts doing podcasts yeah guys uh, johnny's been telling me about this for a while he's been trying to have me on for a while 
And you were our white whale. You were way better. <laughs> me, so you keep bumping me, which I get. You know, you get bottom of the barrel in quarantine, man. It's like, who else could you talk to? But um, no, this is great. Yeah, I, yeah. No, it was, it was good that you came on, dude. Um, yeah, dude, appreciate you uh, taking some time out of, out of the no, day dude. to hang out with us. I don't know if I was – if I filled the void you guys needed, but I hope I – was somewhat entertaining and gave some decent answers. Yeah, yeah. You know what? <laughs> hey, your Our voice audio- cracked there. Johnny, what's going on? <laughs> Our, Johnny's getting COVID. Um, hey, our audience can let us know down below in the comment section, if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, what, A lot of people did, just listen. What did you think of Ian? Let's all check the comment section after we watch Unless this. Unless you're listening to it, and then you'll just have to wonder. Yep, exactly. I kind of oh. forgot that I was like, I, like, I know you guys are recording it, but I forgot like this is going to be a video. It happens to everybody. I'm like, oh God. I mean, I've been drinking last time, but right. anyways.